Why don't we begin with very brief opening statements for, from each of our speakers, and then we'll uh, throw it open for a sort of discussion among us and then with the audience. Thanks. Robert? Um, I start with a proposition that all social organizations need secrets. Um, I doubt very much, I don't know this, but I doubt very much whether the ACLU opens up and streams its board of directors meetings. Uh, I doubt very much whether the New York Times and the Washington Post um, stream their um, editorial board meetings. The government needs secrets, obviously. Um, the question, of course, then, is not are there going to be secrets within the intelligence community? Of course there are. What would it mean for an intelligence community to be transparent? It's, it's a contradiction in terms. So the question is, okay, in a democracy, and, and I understand that in, in, in any democracy, people are going to distrust organizations that are secretive and powerful. And the American intelligence community is both secretive and, pow and powerful. So the question is, in a democracy, what do you do to make sure that, the, that these powerful organizations are kept in a legal box? Um, it's a challenge, but it's not, it's, it's not not doable, and it is done. Um, NSA, I suspect, uh, is the most heavily over, overseen agency in the federal government. Um, when I was general counsel, I, I, it, it seemed as though we were endlessly being overseen by one group or another in all three branches. Um, NSA people are given very detailed instructions about what they may and may not do, legal briefings. And these are not just sort of, you know, you get your briefing when you come in and that's the end of it. There were yearly and frequently more, more often than yearly briefings of people in, the, in, the, in NSA about what can you do, because everybody understood, particularly including NSA employees, that they were dealing with potential risks to privacy. What I find so interesting about the, the Snowden revelations is that when they, when they first came out, Dianne Feinstein, um, the, the, the chairperson of the, of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, basically gave it a yawn because there was nothing that was revealed that she didn't know about. There was nothing in there that, that her counterpart in the House side didn't know about. Um, what I believe is the solution to the question that's going to arise in any democracy is how do you keep intelligence, the apparatus of intelligence, in a legal box is through oversight. In other words, two propositions to the American people. We can tell you what we do for obvious reasons. But we can tell you the amount of oversight that, that, we re, that, that the agency receives. And I think what, what's testi uh, what testifies to this is that in all the Snowden um, revelations, there have been a few, if any, allegations of, um, of, of misuse of these very powerful tools. And again, it's because of the internal controls as well as the external oversight that assures that. Now, in the introduction, and this is, I've served on a number of these panels, as you might expect. Uh, inevitably, somebody raises a specter. What if? Well, you know, I don't know. But that isn't what we have in front of us. We don't have that specter. The one way we could, of course, eliminate any concern whatsoever is to make all, all intelligence collection transparent to the point where we have no intelligence um, uh, collection of any value. Uh, but we would pay a very, very high price if that were the regime we, cho we chose to adopt. Uh, so it should be obvious to you by now that I'm not Anthony Romero, <laughs> as, as your program might have uh, promised, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, before I start, I'd like to invite Bob to the ACLU's next board meeting. Uh, if you don't know, our board has 82 members. Uh, these meetings are beyond tedious uh, and go on for a long time, but I really uh, hope that you would like to attend um, one of these. Maybe I'll start where, you, where Bob finished um, and, and actually start where he started, which is to acknowledge that the problem of democratic oversight of secret programs is a very tricky one in a democracy. And I think we're on a stage, at least, in which everyone up here believes that there are legitimate secrets that governments have to keep. Uh, and I also think that we all agree that uh, in a democracy, that poses a tension. Uh, if the government has to engage in activities without disclosing them to the electorate, 
Uh, that makes it very hard for the electorate to consent to those activities, and it makes it very hard for the electorate to hold government officials accountable. So Bob mentioned one of the ways that democracies have devised uh, to address that problem. And, and remember, this is a pro any, any solution to this problem that, that we've both uh, begun with that doesn't acknowledge that there are real values on both sides uh, isn't really engaging in the conversation, that this is a tension between um, self-government and self-defense. But it's a real tension, and the answer to it isn't that we always lean toward self-defense and ignore the self-government problems. Uh, one of the ways that the U.S. has devised to, to address this tension is to come up with select committees in Congress, um, uh, specialized intelligence courts and courts in general. Uh, and I do think that this, this brings to mind one of the first defenses that we heard from the President and others after the initial Snowden revelations. And, and they said, quite truthfully, uh, that the programs that had been disclosed um, had been approved by all three branches of government. Um, now, Bob would say that that addresses the problem. Um, I would say that that is the problem. Uh, and, and my evidence for that uh, is look at how this debate has changed when the public, through the media, was brought into it. Um, so these issues that had been pretty easily disposed of by secret foreign intelligence courts that hear only from the government, um, the, the ordinary federal courts, when the ACLU and others tried to go into court and say, we believe that this NSA program is unconstitutional, uh, the response of the government was not to defend the constitutionality in court, but rather to say that we had no right to be in court uh, because the program was secret, we had no standing, uh, and so these cases were dismissed without any adjudication by ordinary federal courts. There were no courts um, that actually ruled on the legality of these programs after hearing from both sides. Um, what about Congress? Um, I think it's probably true that Senator Feinstein and others knew, uh, if not all, um, very much most of what has been disclosed uh, since then. Uh, but it reminds me of that very famous moment where Senator Wyden asked the Director of National Intelligence, uh, maybe Bob thinks it wasn't a fair question, but the question was, um, is the NSA collecting any kind of information on millions of Americans? Uh, now, people have said that Clapper's answer then, no, was a lie to Congress, but I actually don't think that's right. Uh, Congress knew that the answer to that question. The people who were lied to were all of us. Uh, we're the ones who, uh, who, who were kept in the dark by that. Now, even the executive branch, uh, in response to the Snowden revelations, as Julian said, has appointed independent panels, uh, has really done a sort of top to bottom review, uh, and has concluded that many of these programs um, have gone beyond what's necessary. Uh, so, you know, I think that it's you know, important to acknowledge here that uh, we do have mechanisms in our democracy that are intended to do this oversight, uh, including Congress, but when they've done the oversight well, they've done it as a result uh, of unauthorized leaks to the press. Uh, that even the Church Committee in the 1970s that, that first reigned in the Intelligence Committee, that, that started with a, with a break-in in an FBI office uh, in Pennsylvania. I mean, th that's what started the ball rolling towards those kinds of hearings. So that um, the answer to the question can't be um, that there are legal constraints in place, we elected people to make the decision uh, about what's secret and what's not, uh, and that's the end of the story. Uh, had people in the intelligence community had their way, um, but for unauthorized leaks to the press uh, by whistleblowers, we would not have known that the case for war in Iraq was built on trumped up evidence. We wouldn't have known about uh, the CIA's network of black site prisons and their rendition program. We wouldn't have known uh, about the Stellar Wind program, about the NSA's warrantless acquisition uh, of the content of Americans' phone calls. These are things that people in a democracy need to know, had to know, would not have known, uh, but for these unauthorized disclosures. So, so very briefly, in the you know, minute or two that, that may be left to me, um, I want to say something about what I think the significance of these disclosures are. Um, and, and if you were going to sort of sum up uh, in a sentence or two um, what those programs that Julian introduced us to signify, uh, to me it is that surveillance technologies and surveillance practice have outpaced democratic controls. Uh, that, that if you think about what protected us from this kind of surveillance apparatus in the past, it was not primarily law. Uh, it was primarily cost and resources and technology. That if governments wanted to track all of our communications and all of our movements, they had to devote considerable resources to doing that. They had to decide who it was that they wanted to track. Uh, if they wanted to store the information uh, that they collected, they had to make decisions about what to keep and what not to keep. You know, 30 years ago, the cost of a gigabyte of, of uh, storage was about $100,000. Now it's about a dime. Um, and, and we have the NSA building gigantic storage facilities so that they can essentially um, record and collect and store as much communications 
um, as they can. Now they're doing this under various legal theories that I think are quite troubling. Um, under a 1970s uh, uh, Supreme Court decision that essentially says that any information that you voluntarily divulge to a third party loses constitutional protection. Uh, the Supreme Court decided this in a case involving the information about a single phone call. Uh, it's now being used to justify the collection of every phone call, uh, as if there's no difference between those two. I think it was Julian who, who said once that, that that's like saying that because doctors say that one to two drinks a night are health, healthy for you, you should drink a million drinks a night. It's actually a different question when you add scale um, to it. And, uh, and then a second legal theory that I think isn't as well um, uh, understood, uh, and this is, the, the, this is a sort of Orwellian word game that the government plays. Uh, they, they essentially argue um, that nothing of constitutional significance occurs when they you know, intercept and store our communications, as long as they put them in a box and don't look at them. And that the Constitution only comes into play arguably when a human being decides to query that database in search of a person or an activity. Uh, and, and that this is the, the, their, one of their constitutional defenses of this metadata program uh, by which they collect and store the information about all of our um, phone calls. Now, there would be no difference to them in, in, in their constitutional analysis if, if um, video cameras in all of our homes were recording all the activities that occurred there, as long as no one was looking at it. Um, many of your homes will be crime scenes if they haven't been already. It might be very useful to the government to have this. You know, I used to use this as a sort of, you know, bottom of the slippery slope until we learned that the GCHQ, the, the NSA's British equivalent, is actually uh, intercepting webcam traffic from Yahoo. Uh, millions and millions of videos that people record, many of them of intimate activities, uh, into a database that the NSA has access to. Uh, so I do think that this is uh, an extremely um, problematic legal theory, that now we have arrived in a world um, in which for the first time ever it is both financially and technologically feasible for governments to collect and store all of our activities, our communications, our movements, uh, to construct what is effectively a surveillance time machine um, that they can hit rewind on and reconstruct very intimate portraits of our lives. Um, Terrorism has largely justified the construction of this apparatus, but terrorism and counterterrorism will not be its primary use uh, because you don't find needles by constructing the world's biggest haystacks. This is not, it's not so useful as a predictive tool to have all this information. It's extremely useful as a forensic tool. Uh, if police and law enforcement got their hands on this kind of, um, you know, sort of massive pile of uh, of data, they would be able to solve a lot of crimes that they're not solving right now. And that's why I think that, that um, while Bob may be right, um, that the world that we live in right now um, is not the world of these sort of science fiction nightmares, uh, I don't think that it's adequate for ha us to have a debate about the world right now. That would be like saying that our debate about climate change has to look at today's climate and not predict what tomorrow's will be. Uh, I, I do think that there's going to be an inevitable mission creep, that if there is another massive terrorist attack, um, since we've collected all of the dots, those dots will always connect in hindsight. Um, and the restrictions that Bob is talking about will be blamed for the terrorist attack, just as the restrictions uh, on data sharing were blamed for the 9-11 attacks uh, in some quarters. And you're going to see the rules that constrain the NSA, which I already think are too limited, um, uh, rescinded even further. Um, so I will leave it with that, and I look forward to a lively exchange. Okay, well, we've heard a little bit from Bob about how surveillance is affecting our security and from Ben about how it's affecting our rights. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how it's affecting our culture and our privacy and our creativity. And I'm going to start where Bob started uh, with his idea, which I agree with, that all organizations need secrets. Organizations like the ACLU and Penn need secrets. And I'm not sure we have those secrets anymore. We worry about whether our secrets are really secret, secret from, you know, in our case, the Chinese or uh, other governments around the world and our own government. So those are real questions, I think, uh, for, for all the organizations represented in some way here. And a question that we focused on is, what really is the harm of surveillance? And we'll talk, I'm sure, uh, later tonight about what the benefits are and the degree to which it has or had mass surveillance, uh, the kind that, 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 that Julian and Bob have described has or hasn't actually abetted uh, counter-terror operations and uncovering of planned terrorist attacks. But on the flip side of the ledger, what are the harms? And that's a question that I think a lot of us have an intuitive feel about, but that uh, we've also been working to adduce evidence on. Uh, at Penn, we did a study 
Late last year, where we surveyed writers, 520 writers here in the US, to ask them about their reaction to mass surveillance. And we were surprised at the results. We honestly didn't know what we would hear, because uh, we, we heard a range of things as we talked to people. But when we surveyed our writers, what they told us is that uh, fully a fourth of them were self-censoring in some way as a result of the revelations of NSA surveillance, which at that point were only a few months old. So there were either issues they were not covering in their reporting, topics they were afraid to research, people they were afraid to communicate with because of concern about somebody watching, about triggering a flag, about being tripped up in some way because of engagement with activities or issues or subjects that somebody might find suspicious. And we called the report Chilling Effects because we found it chilling to discover that writers were really constraining themselves uh, so quickly and in such numbers as a result of NSA surveillance. And we also wondered, frankly, you know, was this an anomalous result? Did we sort of ask the questions at a moment where we were likely to get uh, you know, perhaps inflated answers, but we're seeing more evidence come in. There was a study that was released by MIT just within the last 10 days or so where they examined all internet searches and they looked at sort of before and after the NSA, the, the, the beginning of the Snowden revelations, and what they found was on a range of kind of sensitive terms that they identified that there was a statistically significant and notable drop in searches, not just about terms that might trigger scrutiny from a national security perspective, so things like dirty bomb or nerve agent, but also uh, things that were personally sensitive, searches on t subjects like depression or body odor. They found dropped notably uh, in their before and after study uh, relative to the Snowden revelations, and that was in contrast to all other internet searches, which continued to increase in volume just as the uh, growth of the population online uh, has increased. So I think we'll see more uh, revealing evidence coming in. And, and you know, it's not just what we know about what's happening in the here and now. And as Ben points out, it's, it's very early days to make those judgments, but we know a lot historically. We know about surveillance all over the world, and particularly in repressive societies where Penn has done a lot of work with writers who've lived under surveillance and lived to tell the story, and the kind of fear, mistrust, paranoia, the fraying of relationships uh, and ties within communities and even families that happens in environments of repressive and pervasive surveillance. We know about the history of domestic surveillance here in this country and the targeting, the misuse of the information to target and infringe upon freedom of association and freedom of expression, particularly of groups and organizations that come under scrutiny. So, you know, right now it might feel far-fetched, but we do know that historically this is what has happened. And then finally, targeted surveillance in our own era uh, and what has happened to communities that have come under uh, heightened scrutiny in the aftermath of 9-11 and the impacts that that's had uh, on, on their ties, on their sense of well-being and security, uh, on their sense of ostracization or acceptance within society. So. This story of the impact is continuing to be developed, and it, of course, will tie in to a legal analysis of whether these programs are justified or warranted, and whether uh, the harms that they cause and the risks that they pose may outweigh the benefits. And from our perspective, we have to look not just at the fir Fourth Amendment and the restrictions on search and seizure, but also, very importantly, at the First Amendment, and at whether the great freedoms that we've always enjoyed in this country to think about, uh, communicate about, write about, whatever we want are in a subtle way being encroached upon. And when we did that survey of writers, we really thought of them as sort of the canaries in the coal mine when it comes to free expression. Writers are the uber users of free expression. They depend on free expression for their craft, for their livelihood. So if we're seeing a chill on free expression here in the United States, it, it, makes, it, it stood to reason for us that we would see it first uh, among writers. And I'm just gonna leave you with one quote from our survey uh, that, that sort of describes it from the perspective of one of our writers. The codification of surveillance as a new norm with all different forms and layers is changing the world in ways I think we fail to grasp still. 
And one of the things I've learned through repeat visits to another country with a strong police and military presence is what it feels like not to know whether or exactly how you're being watched due to some categorization you may not even know about. This is a great concern to me. The sense that this condition is spreading so rapidly in different nations now, or perhaps more accurately, that the foundations are being laid and reinforced so that by the time we fully realize that we live in this condition, it will be too late to alter it. And so since, we've, since Robert is uh, informally outnumbered, um, I want to just give him an opportunity to respond to what we heard from the other two speakers. Uh, just a couple of points. It's I, I've done a few of these, um, and it's always somewhat frustrating because w what almost always happens is the discussion of what's happening today transmogrifies into something down into the future which will end civilization as we know it. Um, I was just making a note of some of the emotionally laden terms. Uh, two of my colleagues referred to the secret foreign intelligence court. Ooh, that sounds like KBG. The court isn't secret. You can find out the names of the judges. The judges are all Article Three judges, meaning they're, you know, they're chosen by the president under Article Three of the Constitution, and they have lifetime tenure. Uh, the Chief Justice chooses who's, who gets, the, who, who gets the, to serve on the court for some period of time. There's nothing secretive about that. The content is secret. Um, one of the comments from my colleague, Ben, was uh, that, that there's only one side represented. To be sure, not by any means unique. Uh, the um, grand jury proceedings, there are no, there are no counsel for, for the person whose indictment may or may not issue forth. Um, and moreover, the question would be, well, who, who would the, whom would the, um, this other lawyer represent? Some abstract notion of, of privacy interests? Um, the Should reason, we pause on this and maybe have a No, actually, if you just let me finish that, uh, and then I, we I, could. Yeah, yeah I was looking to say on this point. Thank you. Um, other <laughs> emotional terms, whistleblower. What whistles blown? Enormous numbers of top secret documents were leaked. You can call them a whistleblower if it makes you feel better, but let's not blink what actually happened. Videos in the bedroom. You know, th this is not stuff that is happening that could happen under the law. It, you know, there is no question that all power, if you take it to its logical extreme, can, can, can lead to evil. Um, I'm somewhat reminded of, of, of uh, of the, the Nixon enemies list. Um, as you all know, back during the, the Watergate era, um, it, it, it came out that Nixon had an enemies list. And initially there was, oh my gosh, this is awful. But over time, the Washington community began taking pleasure in the fact that they, a particular person, was on that enemies list. It was a matter of prestige. It was a matter of something to talk about at Washington parties. Writers in this country who are worried that NSA is somehow listening or taking down what they're writing, in my view, are living in a fantasy world. It just isn't happening. Thanks. Fair enough. Um, can, I, can I respond? Yeah, well, it, was really we, it was personal enough. I think we should give a chance to respond a little bit. Um, cameras in the bedroom are happening. I don't know if you've read, what is, Julian, what's the name of the GCHQ program where they turn on webcams in people's computers and record what's going on in their bedrooms? It is happening. I'm not defending No, no, but England. you said it was a I'm fantasy. Not, I'm not defending England. I think we're talking about the United States of America. And, and, and that data is searchable through an NSA program called X Key Score, so it's available to NSA analysts. If, if, if that's the distinction between what England is doing and what's America, what America is doing now, I'm saying the fact that England is doing it now makes it not the crazy hypothetical that you suggested that it might be a second ago. Um, on the question of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, um, let me concede the existence of the court is not a secret. Uh, and then in fact, for most of what the court does, it's not at all inappropriate that it only hears from the government. Um, for mo for the court was set up to give warrants. Uh, when courts give warrants, invariably there's only one side represented. You don't want to tip off the recipient, you don't want to tip off the target um, that there is going to be surveillance conducted. And that happens not just in the FISA court, but in every court. The problem is uh, that in the last decade, this court that was set up to only issue warrants uh, has been writing 30, 60, 90 page opinions uh, in which they analyze and rule on 
the legality and constitutionality of surveillance programs. That is something um, that courts ought not to do without some kind of adversarial process, as many of the judges who have sat on that court have said in the last year. Uh, and, and to me, that's what's troubling, is that those issues, if, 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 if a court is going to decide whether someone should get a warrant or not, um, I, I agree 100% that that decision should be made without adversarial process and in secret. Uh, if a court is going to decide um, whether a dragnet surveillance program comports with the Fourth Amendment, uh, I would want that judge to hear from somebody, I think he's writing down dragnet as another emotional word, but what, what, when I say dragnet, what I mean is uh, a program that collects everything on people who are not suspected of anybody so that it has uh, that information later on to search. Um, just lastly, a word on the word whistleblower. Um, I actually don't want to get into a debate about what that word means. Um, if your definition of whistleblower is someone who discloses only previously unknown illegal conduct, uh, then certainly much of what Edward Snowden did can't be called by that definition whistleblowing uh, because uh, the, the programs that he disclosed to journalists are things that people in government were well aware of. Uh, his bosses knew about them, congressional committees knew about them. Uh, I, I do want to point out here that the number of documents that he's released to the public is zero. Um, every disclosure that we've learned about um, since June 5th um, has come from The Guardian or The New York Times or Der Spiegel or The Washington Post. None have come from Edward Snowden directly. Uh, every one of those was a decision by journalists and their editors in consultation with governments about what would or would not be in the public interest to be published. I'm sure there's huge disagreements about what those definitions are, but I want to be clear about what Snowden did and what he didn't do. Yes. Yeah, I mean, just let me say a word about, you know, whether all these writers are crazy. Um, and, you know, you're not alone in thinking that, but you know, most of them, we asked them, well, what, what is it you're afraid to write about? And they said, well, it's things like, our, you know, store, research and counterterror, uh, work on the Middle East, uh, work on issues of sexual violence in the military, things that they thought were sensitive. And, you know, not that they necessarily thought there would be immediate uh, scrutiny or attention, but the idea of their emails, their communications being collected in a database, uh, and, and nobody believes, I mean, I'll, I'll just say this, uh, you know, we asked, do you believe, uh, you know, when, the, when uh, it said that everything's gonna be destroyed in three or five years, nobody believes that. People believe whatever they, uh, whatever is handed over, whatever is collected is going to be retrievable some way, somehow, if they want to, badly enough, you know, years, years later. So if you think about something like, the anthrax uh, incident, which was an unsolved mystery, you know, if they had all this data and all of our emails, you know, would they not have poured through to see, you know, who was looking at that topic in any way, shape, or, to or form in order to try to get to the bottom of it? May I comment? Sure. <laughs> um, yes, I did write down Dragnet because that's one of the that's one of the fantasies. Um, um, sorry, I, I was surveilling you. I apologize. Um, uh, one of the notions uh, fed by movies such as um, um, Enemy of the State is that, um, and fed actually by Mr. Snowden as well, uh, is that the NSA collects everything and can collect everything. And so every step in your life is, is, uh, is known. Um, nothing could be, well, I shouldn't say nothing could be further from the truth. I'm sure I'll hear more <laughs> this evening. Um, um, <laughs> a little humor there, Ben. I'm, I'm laughing. <laughs> um, uh, the fact is that in people's fantasies about what NSA can do and what it does do, if it were true, half the United States would have to, a population of the United States would have to work for NSA so they could listen in on the communications of the other half. Um, these massive collection programs, it bears emphasis. We're talking about metadata, and that's, you know, Call the, the, the phone number to, phone number from, the time um, uh, of the call, and the duration of the call. Now, you might say, well, why do they need that? Well, there's a very good answer for that. Um, and it is not the question of the volume of documents. It's a question of to what use are they being put. Often in the battlefields in the Middle East, uh, a, a, a bad guy is killed or captured. In his pocket is the term of art in the intel community's pocket litter. You know, a, a slip of paper with a phone number written on it. 703-555-1212. Um, that piece of paper is then taken back and basically there's a yell into the, into the, um, into the data collection. Is there a 703-555-1212 out there? 
and the ping comes back, yes, here it is. That's not an unuseful piece of information. Is it content? There's no content. But from that, you can do a couple of steps away and understand and, and try to put it in context. And if you get a couple of those pieces of pocket litter that are all going to the same phone number, that's useful. Now, in order to do that at all, you need huge amounts of documents. Um, ask yourself how threatened are you by the fact your fingerprints are taken every time you enter the United States. How many hundreds of millions of fingerprint copies are there with the FBI? None of us feels threatened by that, I don't think. The question is not how much data, the question is to what you So we actually, let's, let's, let's interrogate that for a second because you said to do that you need huge amounts of documentation. The original understanding of 215 was that um, just of course this could be used if you had a particular number, you could go to the phone company and say, I want records uh, of this phone number or involving this phone number. Mm -hmm. um, why, why do you need the entire database as opposed to the more traditional model of, we've got a number, now we go to AT&T and say, give us this number's records, not everyone's records. Well, there are a number of answers to that question. Uh, and I, there's, this touching, there's this touching notion that somehow our, our privacy rights are more secure if the, if the telcos, the telephone companies, hold the records rather than NSA. Um, do you actually believe that? Um, every day in the newspaper, there are, t there are talks about leaks out of, um, uh, out of you know, various um, corporations, various uh, companies uh, selling products. This stuff leaks from them all the time. This stuff doesn't leak out of NSA. And by the way, with, with the documents that Mr. Snowden, uh, <laughs> sorry? It did leak out, or <laughs> well, yes. something leaked out. Right? I mean, a, a, a contractor with a high school education who wasn't even working for NSA was able to, we, we don't know if 12 others did this and didn't give it to reporters. They might have given it to China and Russia. Um, yes, I love the, your notion that somehow he didn't leak the documents. The he did. The, of course he did. Of to, course he to did. Who? To those newspapers. Oh, yeah, yeah, With no, I conceded, knowledge. conceded. Okay. No, no, I'm saying that they're making the decisions about what the public sees. Yes, and that's, and that's, 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 that's also yeah, yeah. Uh, somewhat worrisome. Somehow, the, wherever these documents are being held by the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Guardian and so forth, those are more secure than the computers at NSA. A ridiculous proposition. Except that demonstrably true, because the only entity that we know of to date that has lost control of those documents are the NSA and the GCHQ, not the New York Times and the Guardian. But yes. Well, let's, 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 this is a, a question that we often hear about friends. Is, oh, Google has so much information about you. Facebook has so much information about you. Why are you so much more worried about NSA? So maybe, since you've done surveys involving writers, you can speak to that. Why? are people more concerned about what an essay has than about what Google or Facebook has? Well, I mean, they're concerned about both, but in different ways. I mean, I think the idea of how the information is going to be used, I mean, people are sort of offended by the idea that their information will be uh, used by internet service providers and platforms to market to them, to help them with ads, to, you know, aggregate them and look at, you know, the patterns of you know, 40-year-old women or whatever it may be, you know, when they buy vitamins. Uh, but with the NSA, the concern is different. I mean, it's our government. It has power over us. It has the ability to, uh, to, to indict us, to investigate us, to interfere with our lives in a much more profound way. So I think people are concerned about both. And there's been, you know, great surrender of privacy to corporations you know, kind of arguably voluntarily. We put so many things up on our Facebook page and communicate through social media. You know, we sign, we click on all kinds of terms of reference that we haven't had a chance to read. And so people, I think, are beginning to wake up to recognition that they've surrendered privacy. Uh, in some ways, they don't like. There's evidence over the last year that people are beginning to rethink that, that they're less likely to opt in uh, to voluntarily uh, give personally identifying information to websites. So I think we're beginning to see the backlash there, but that it is more potent when uh, it's going into the hands of your government. Um, but although, so if, if one of the harms here is the chilling effect, the sort of the panoptic chill that people feel because they know NSA has these capabilities, um, is, is that an argument for more secrecy? We well, would I mean, be fine if as long as we didn't know about it, we wouldn't be worried. You know, I mean, I do think we're in a fundamentally different situation given that, you know, this has all now been revealed. It can't go back in the genie's bottle. 
we know about it, and that's affecting us in ways that weren't true before we knew about it. And you know, so that's, you know, we can't unwrite that history, and we now have to grapple with the effects of these programs uh, as known, known quantities in our society. Let me actually turn to uh, Robert here, since we're associated with a, a uh, literary conference, uh, I want to invoke uh, a notorious author of fiction, Stephen Glass. Um, <laughs> Because often when I hear it asserted that we don't need to worry, there's been no abuses uncovered, I think of Stephen Glass, who, as I assume many people here will know, was the uh, fabulous author of a number of articles at the New Republic in the late 90s, where he was a sort of superstar, hotshot, rising young reporter. They had an extraordinarily rigorous fact-checking system there that they brought over from the New Yorker. And it was very good at catching mistakes, at catching errors. Um, you know, you, you got a number wrong or you got a quote slightly flubbed from a real person, the fact check system would catch it. But the fact check system wasn't well designed to deal with someone like Glass, who understood the system, the fact checking system, from the inside and was deliberately tailing his fabrications to defeat the system. Um, and so when we look back at history and see that the abuses that occurred in the past involving illegal wiretapping of civil rights leaders and other political dissidents involved that very kind of consciousness of oversight. Uh, JFK, for example, had a, a program called June Mail where the fruits of illegal surveillance or material that was sort of embarrassing but not directly related to a criminal investigation would be funneled directly to him, to his personal and confidential files, so it didn't end up in central FBI records, so there would be nothing for overseers to find. Um, we know that this is the kind of thing that when abuses have happened in the past, they've come with deliberate attempts to circumvent oversight. Um, so I suppose I wonder, in a sense, why should we be confident that if abuses happen today, they won't be similarly crafted to evade oversight? And is there a way, and I guess let me also throw this to the other end of this, is there a way so if you assume when abuses happen, the people doing it will be clever about it, um, to satisfy ourselves that secret surveillance can occur, um, assuming we, we don't want to eliminate secret surveillance, um, you know, in a way that we are comfortable enough with, given that possibility. Uh, the answer to your question is um, we will not have to worry about this um, once man becomes perfected. <laughs> I mean, these are human institutions. Of course there are going to be screw-ups. Of course there are going to be hose-ups. And worst of all are people that are determined to try to work around the system. What, what, what NSA tries to do, as any intelligent agency tries to do, is to develop oversight mechanisms that are rigorous and robust and tested. Um, for example, at NSA, the, the, when I was general counsel, the chief operations lawyer had come out of operations. He knew where the bodies were buried. He knew whom to ask. He knew whom to talk to. He walked the floors saying what's going on. Uh, he was terrific and he was, and he was very energetic. And every once in a while stuff would come over the transom saying, have you looked into this? And we would look into it. We'd bring in the IG to look into it. There are all kinds of checks. For example, there's keystroke auditing. Keystroke auditing is it's basically a program that every key you, you strike creates a memory, and it goes someplace. So that if, you, if, if it looks like there's some illegal activity, you can go back and see who did that. Um, the, the point is this is true in all organizations. It's true in, on the, on the, on the, on the um, social welfare side of the United States. It's true in big cities. It's true in states. What you need is rigorous oversight. But does that scale? I mean, so one of the things we've seen is that a series of cases where, for example, the FISA court had imposed a series of rules. The system was so vast and complicated that, in General Alexander's words, no one even inside the NSA really understood how all the components fit together. Uh, and so, I mean, one question to ask is, is there a point at which the scale becomes so overwhelming that oversight becomes basically not possible? Why don't you... No, no. I, I don't have I, 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 I'll only say that um, 
it's telling not only that whatever accountability mechanisms and oversight were in place, they were not enough to prevent someone in Snowden's position from leaving the agency with what he left with, but that the NSA still has not been able to recreate his actions and still um, doesn't have a clear idea of what he took. And I think that that, uh, <laughs> that ought to be frightening to everybody that? here. I, I, well, I'm, I know what I read. Uh, right. And I know a little more than what I read, but I don't know. Uh, I know that they have said that they are making guesses uh, about uh, about what he's taken. Perhaps they know exactly um, what he has, but I won't, I won't go into any discussions that I've had with him or with the government about that subject. I do want to ask, though, Bob, one question. I mean, we, we both agree that there is a dial that needs to be turned between secrecy and public disclosure in a democracy. We might put it in different places, um, but has the public reaction in the last year um, changed at all your view of where that dial should have been. The fact that, let me just finish this point, uh, you know, a Congress that had not been paying a lot of attention to this uh, is now considering historic bipartisan legislation uh, that would fundamentally alter some of these programs at least, that, that courts are reaching different decisions, that, that federal courts are now adjudicating the legality of these programs instead of dismissing them on standing, um, that the president has actually discontinued um, some of these activities. Do, what does it mean um, if intelligence secret intelligence programs are revealed and then cannot survive public scrutiny. Uh, you might disagree with the public about it, uh, but doesn't it almost mean by definition that too much was secret if the public rejects it once it learns about it? Um, I think the answer to that is no. Um, um, first of all, I, in any of these debates, the public is invoked. We're in New York City, a very sophisticated part of the world people attending this thing are extraordinarily sophisticated people who are clearly interested in literature, which by itself distinguishes it from a substantial number of people in this country. Um, generally speaking, and I, I can't cite anything uh, in the last couple of weeks, but generally speaking, every time a poll is taken of the American people as a whole, not the editorial writers of the New York Times, or not Penn officials, not ACLU officials, but of America as a whole, the support for these programs tends to be very high. For example, after that, the leak of that special NSA program that you were adverting to er, er, earlier this evening, a poll was taken and something like 70 or 80 percent overwhelmingly supported what NSA was doing. Look, I'm not, I, I would never deny, and in fact I've argued this repeatedly with, with, um, with, with my students, I would never deny that there isn't a trade-off between security uh, and, 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 and privacy. I mean, clearly, we surrender privacy in a civilized society. You know, it's what I think Felix Frankfurter called the, the decisions uh, to create uh, ordered, ordered society. You know, the, the absence of, 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 of law means chaos. Um, when I go to an airport and I have to undress, I'm losing, losing some element of liberty. When I checked into the hotel here this evening, I had to show a driver's license. Um, those are all fairly new fairly new events. The question is where in that spectrum are you willing to are you willing to place yourself, bearing in mind that the cost may well be a matter of security. But so how do we make that Can I just or, respond to one thing? I appreciate uh, your esteem for the literary audience, which I share, <laughs> but I do want to say, uh, you know, from the polls that we've looked at, uh, and principally the Pew polls, I really, I, I don't think you're right. I mean, the, the poll is very split on this. I mean, it, it's about 50-50. I'm looking at one uh, that I happen to have in front of me, and it's exactly 50% uh, approves, and 50% uh, does not. So. It's, you know, people are divided. That's the general public. The numbers for writers are different. You know, 66% of writers disapprove, so the numbers are different. What a surprise. Different. What's that? What a surprise. No, it's, well, maybe not. Uh, but I, I don't think it's, it's fair to say the average American uh, is, is sanguine about that. So of course we accept there are some trade-offs between privacy and security. Nobody, uh, I, I don't think, would dispute that. The question is, you know, where are we drawing the lines exactly. and who gets to decide? And it's not effete New Yorkers who are opposed to the surveillance state. It's Tea Party Republicans. You know, Senator Schumer and Dianne Feinstein are strong defenders of the NSA. Uh, it's Rand Paul uh, and it's people on the libertarian right who have been leading the charge Absolutely. for more. So anyway, I just am coming to the Great. cultural defense of my brothers and sisters here. <laughs> I think the NRA actually joined one of the uh, first, first Unitarian. Uh, the NRA has joined one of these lawsuits because they realized that the um, 
metadata collection could include gun records and so on. I think that's the first time pen has been on the same side. Yeah, it's an unusual. So actually, let's try to make this a little bit more concrete. I mean, one of the problems here is that it is, when we talk about trade-offs in the abstract, that's fine. But you have a, a situation where, on the one hand, the benefits are almost impossible to disclose publicly. I mean, you, you, when, when a particular mode of surveillance is useful in disrupting terrorist activity, of course, that can't be publicly disclosed. Um, although, on the other hand, we've learned sometimes some of the, the claims about the utilities programs are um, hold up less well under independent scrutiny um, than, than the, sort of the first pass. And on the other hand, the costs are almost impossible to sort of accurately gauge because, well, you know, if people feel a chill, how do you measure that? If, again, you know, going by history, what, if and when the authorities are abused, that will not come with a press release. It will will not be uh, sourced to NSA or FBI. It will be um, through probably some other means where the, 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 the link between uh, surveillance and whatever harm accrues will not be apparent uh, you know, immediately, if ever. Um, what mechanisms would we be satisfied with? On, 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 on one hand, what mechanisms do you think are, are sufficient to, um, to guarantee that, in fact, the intrusion is justified by a real security gain? And on, on the other hand, Assuming, again, we're going to have some secret surveillance, what mechanisms beyond what we have in place now would make you say, OK, that's enough. Um, now we're happy to allow this to continue. Whoever wants to grab that first. Yeah, sure. Um, I think the mechanisms that are in place now are sufficient. Um, bear in mind, this is not, you know, and once again, these things always devolve into a discussion of what happened in the Nixon administration or what's going to happen in 20 years ago, uh, 20 years from now. Um, the, the Church Pike hearings grew out of clear and obvious abuses within the intelligence community. And the response was the creation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Um, since then, there has been rigorous oversight, I mean, to the point that operators will challenge, at NSA, operators will challenge a program because they, their instinct is that it isn't lawful. So you have to go and actually show a FISA order or, 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 or some other dispositive um, uh, uh, ruling that says this is lawful. What the, the, all this conversation did not come out of an abuse. It came out of a leak of a huge number of documents. So, so, so let me put back on the slide, right? It seems like one of the differences that, that Ben alluded to earlier is that there's a difference in the architecture. Say in the 70s, if you wanted to improperly you know, listen in on the, uh, what was happening in the Office of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. You needed to have someone go and install a microphone in the Office of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, if the surveillance architecture is built into the backbone now, it's basically a, a question of what a couple lines of code say that distinguish between um, you know, voluminous but appropriate collection of um, foreign persons linked in some way to a, a, a violent group and large-scale collection of people who are visiting the ACLU website um, is the, and of course, happens, but, but the architecture makes it much easier to very quickly go from appropriate to inappropriate in a way that required a certain amount of elbow grease in the past. So, I mean, do you think the difference in the architecture requires a difference in the level of control? Of course the threat of abuse is always there. You know, these are people in, a, in an institution. Name me a large institution that hasn't had scandal. You know, that's why there is oversight. And, you know, yes, I, I, I suspect that a, a good fiction writer could, you know, cook up a, a very complicated plot that somehow would bypass that stuff. But it, it would be extraordinarily hard to do, in large part because, you know, this is, again, a fantasy out of... Um, out of movies like Enemy of the State, uh, when somebody wants, wants some information, they're kind of like um, Abby in NCIS. She goes to her, her you know, keyboard and punches in 20 or 30 numbers, and the answer to any possible question shows up on the screen. That is a terrible metaphor for NSA. A far better metaphor for NSA is the superintendent in the bottom of a large building opening and closing pipes. You. NSA is, is not an organization that one or two people can do something with as a general rule. 
normally requires lots and lots of people, which means you, you not only have to be evilly intended, you need to find three, four, five, ten other people who have that same kind of uh, evil intent. Extraordinarily hard to do. In 2009, the New York Times reported that an NSA analyst had been reprimanded for reading Bill Clinton's emails. Um, we know from the some of the Snowden revelations that a program called X Key Score allows anybody who has access to it to type in uh, a private email address or a phone number and immediately pull up all the content associated with that person. It may not be any of the state, but it doesn't require 12 or 20 people uh, to do it. We know that uh, NSA well, had a skeptical then, by the way. When was the last time you were in NSA? Uh, a while ago. When yeah. was the last time you were? No, I, I, I looked at the documents that were published, <laughs> and I read. Yeah. You're skeptical that an NSA analyst was reprimanded in 2009 for reading Bill Clinton's emails? Reprimand, Maybe the New York Times lied about that. Reprimands happen all the time. Well, I'm skeptical that anybody can sit at a computer at NSA and hearken up the emails of President Clinton or President Obama, uh, as I understand. A, pri Mr. a private email address would all would be all that was needed technologically. Now there might be uh, bureaucratic reasons, but they're not technical. They're not well, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, it's uh, not uh, implausible that Bill Clinton be in communication with foreign persons who right. maybe who legitimately are, are targeted. That, by that, that's, all, that's another possibility. But that but, is a possibility, right? But that's yeah, a different thing. That is a, that is a different thing, but, but none of these things require 15 people, and it didn't require 15 people for, uh, for Mr. Snowden to be able to leave the NSA with what he left with, but yes. But as, as just as a representative of an organization that's international, uh, I don't think we should be quick to dismiss the concerns of those whose communications unquestionably are uh, under the 702 program, the content of which can be and is swept up, and it includes many, you know, communications with Americans, and, you know, we represent writers all over the world. This is uh, being used as a precedent in other countries. Uh, it's, it, it draws a very clear and sharp distinction between the level of protection that we afford to Americans, whether we think that's sufficient or not. Uh, and we, we, we unequivocally don't offer that level of protection to people around the world. And I think that is, uh, you know, th there are deep questions about American leadership that are raised by that, by the kind of standards that we expect other people to uh, uphold. Uh, you know, we were, the United States has positioned itself as a major defender and proponent of internet freedom. And I think that claim really gets called into question. So. I don't want to be quick to dismiss uh, the, the implications of international surveillance in this discussion. Well, so let's, uh, in, in the 15 or so minutes we have left, uh, try and throw this to the audience. Uh, we have microphones set up uh, alongside the stage here. So if you have something you'd like to ask our panelists, please step up. I will um, request that people adhere to the uh, three sentence rule, which is somewhere <laughs> around the end of your third sentence. Um, I, I would ask that your voice ascend in a way that suggests that a query um, is being presented. Um, I have a, oh. a comment with reference to the chilling effect. My mother, a retired school teacher, lives in Western Europe. We no longer discuss international politics since we know that all of our telephone calls are being recorded. Um, <laughs> we're not plotting the overthrow of the government, but I'm terribly offended. I work with immigrant students here. I no longer tell them that we have a fine constitution, which I used to in the past. And I uh, recently, I uh, came back from France twice, and I was, I've never been fingerprinted as a citizen with a US passport coming into the country. However, recently I was told to stand in line with all other people getting off an airplane and have my picture taken and my, my passport photocopied. Um, I was horrified and appalled that I, as a citizen, would have this done to me. But even more appalling is the fact that the citizens of the country have absolutely no say in these new procedures that are being put upon us. And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, it, maybe it won't be long before we're all fingerprinted every time we come into the country or we have our irises photographed of our eyeballs or whatever. But those things are being done to foreign visitors, and so maybe that's next in line for what's going to be done. So my, my question is, why don't we as citizens have any rights to um, be aware or to have our voices heard if this is a democracy in what sort of things are being imposed upon us? You want me to take 
Yeah. But I have a comment um, as well. Yeah, no, we do, as citizens, have rights to have our voices heard. Yours was heard, mine is being heard, Bob's is being heard. Uh, Congress is hearing us now. Um, I, I, I agree with you uh, that too much was going on without public consultation. Um, certainly many of the programs that we've discussed tonight should not have been concealed from the American public. Um, there, the debate about them has not disclosed operational details. Uh, the fact that the NSA is using an act of Congress uh, to collect metadata on all Americans' phone calls um, hasn't tipped off anybody to anything. We should have had this debate before that um, uh, tactic was employed and not after uh, it had been used in secret for a number of years. But, but I, I, I don't think that you're powerless uh, I don't think that there's nothing that, that, that you don't have a say in this. Um, you know, these policies can be changed by elected officials. We do need to know about them first, but you just talked about things that you do know about um, and, and can petition your government about. When the, when the phones that you were concerned about were tapped, I can't help wondering whether it was really the Americans or the French or the Germans or the, um, or the British. I mean, the fact is what NSA does very, very well many countries in the world try to do. Um, it's just, it is in the nature of governments to want intelligence. And if the U.S. were not collecting intelligence, I expect people in here, but certainly the bulk of Americans will say, what the hell are you people doing if you're not protecting this country? Let's uh, go to the other mic. Hi, my question is about the proliferation of surveillance technology internationally, and I want to wonder who, I often wonder who creates the tools that the NSA uses, whether or not private organizations or in partnership with the NSA. I don't know this for sure, but whether or not those programs are then sold to governments abroad, so who creates that technology, and then how does the USA control the sale of those to foreign governments? Um, and what are the regulations around that, and, and how, how is that? Organized. There's a guy named Steve in Fort Meade. No, um. <laughs> the bulk of that equipment is stuff built by people, if I can judge your age from here, people roughly of your age. Um, it does, and, and by the way, all over the world. Um, there are restrictions on the sale of weapons type things under, do you remember the acronym? Foreign, foreign Something Control Act. Um, I doubt whether much in the in, in this area would be controlled. Hackers only look at hackers all over the place. But it is a concern uh, that we have about uh, the export of surveillance technologies to repressive governments around the world, places like Ethiopia that are notoriously uh, harsh and brutal toward activists, dissidents, and are now using, in some cases, American-made surveillance technologies to carry out their, their programs. American made, not necessarily NSA made. Right. Right. No, no. that we wouldn't know about. That's well, right. I'm, I'm telling you that. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is, this is a thing that certainly came up during the, uh, the Arab Spring, the use of um, American-made um, surveillance accounts by companies like Palantir and Norris sure. um, by regimes that uh, are less um, <laughs> protective of civil liberties than um, than ours, and even accidental instances. There was back, uh, so probably close to a decade ago now, there was a case where in uh, Athens, a major Greek cell phone provider uh, had software running on their uh, central circuit that was basically built with, uh, to comply with uh, US uh, legislation called the Communications Systems for Law Enforcement Act to have lawful intercept capabilities built into it for law enforcement. That was exploited by still unknown, I think, hackers to essentially collect these cell phone communications on a very large scale of senior members of the Greek government, uh, major corporate CEOs, uh, still not known who was actually behind that intrusion. Um, let's go to the other side. I, I actually have a somewhat similar point, which is that the history of technology is the history of technology proliferation. So we invented nuclear weapons. Now North Korea has nuclear weapons. Uh, so part of what needs to be considered is if the United States is going to work with private enterprise to make it possible to do total surveillance of all communications, it is foolish to think 
that that capability will be limited to the United States. We are attempting to establish a system that the U.S. can access, but it needs to be assumed that North Korea is going to access that and many other uh, repressive regimes around the world. So it, it's, it's disturbing to me to think that the debate is limited to is the technology we're creating something that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court can control and does NSA have a good inspector general? Because none of these things exist in completely different countries. It, it has an excellent uh, inspector general, by the way. Let me put a slight spin on this. One of the things NSA has come to criticism for uh, is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Bull Run, um, the suggestion that in order to ensure their own ability to intercept, and in particular to translate the plain text of encrypted communications, um, they had done things to degrade the quality of widely used encryption systems in a way that, that degraded security not just against NSA but against external attackers. And I'm wondering as someone who obviously was inside, um, I guess during the, the early part of Bull Run, whether you think that is uh, a valid concern or whether you think um, that, was not, that was not a problem. I don't really have anything to say on that. Fair enough, I suppose you may not be able to. Um, but I mean, in, in response to that point, um, uh, it's a critical point to acknowledge that um, the U.S. is ahead of the rest of the world for, for, for various reasons. I mean, one of them is that the U.S. has more sophisticated technology. The other is has to do with the architecture of the internet and how many communications are routed through the United States and basically how internet governance has worked. But it's absolutely the case that the technologies that allow us um, to collect and store uh, communications on a mass scale uh, are getting cheaper uh, and are going to be available to, to much smaller governments around the world. There, there is actually, um, you know, I think. Uh, a lot that we can do to address this problem on a global scale that doesn't even necessarily uh, you know, require a lot of law. Um, much of what the NSA and other intelligence agencies do in order to facilitate their collection uh, is they try to make communication systems less secure in specific ways so that they can get into them. Um, whether that is degrading an encryption standard, um, whether that is um, purchasing on a private market software vulnerabilities, and rather than disclosing them to the, to the companies uh, so that they can be fixed, uh, exploiting them so that they can get in and perhaps others can get in. Uh, we do need to reorient uh, some of our focus towards defense and away from offense, um, towards securing our communications. Now, securing our communications will make it harder um, for us, for the NSA, uh, to get at those communications. not impossible. The NSA spends tens of billions of dollars a year. Uh, if they want any one conversation, they're going to be able to get it. Uh, it will make it harder for them and everyone else to collect on a broader scale, uh, and it will protect communications uh, of citizens in countries whose regimes are a lot less friendly uh, than ours. Actually, NSA works very hard with private companies to close up windows, to, to, to close up vulnerabilities. Right. except when it doesn't. And except right. what it doesn't. Right. Right. So would you, what do you think of the uh, surveillance review that its recommendation to sort of split off? I the... think that would be a terrible mistake um, um, from a functional standpoint. I'm not talking about a civil libertarian issue. Purely from a functional standpoint, those two, the two parts of NSA feed each other. Um, if, 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 a, if I'm you know, making this up, if the operations people find a vulnerability, um, they, can, they can point it out. Uh, to the up to the secure side, the security people, on the other hand, if they find some sort of problem with American communications, they can point it out to the op side. These two things work absolutely. In, uh, they, they work as a unity, and that's very very important. All right. Let's try and squeeze in a, a couple more before we Thanks. wrap up. I'm uh, Magnus Ark with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Thank you for a very interesting uh, panel. I want to ask uh, Robert a question. Susan pointed to the U.S. as uh, as a leader, a global role model for freedom of expression, free speech, historically, that's, I think, a fact. And as an organization, we often point to that around the world when we love, advocate for a free press. Is that an argument that resonates within the NSA, this role of the US as, as a role model? Maybe the most recent example I saw was uh, in, in, in Egypt with the Al Jazeera staff being uh, imprisoned and one of the ministers there 
pointed to the U.S. and said that the leak prosecutions, that's kind of the same as what we're doing here. You see those arguments pop up around the world. I wonder, is that something you discuss within the NSA, or does that doesn't resonate? I, I'm sorry. I, I have a hard time understanding the question. I, I think he's asking whether... I don't mean the English. I understood the English. I didn't understand the thrust of the question, but perhaps you can help me on that. I understood the thrust of the question. I mean, he's asking whether in the debates within the NSA about the scope of these programs and, and the boundaries for privacy sort of enters into the calculus uh, that, that these programs may undermine U.S. leadership globally on free expression. Is that something that uh, enters into the equation? Yeah, this is always brought out as sort of a First Amendment type issue. Do you notice how chill we all are? Do you notice how chill the New York Times and the, and, and the Washington Post have been in, in, in publicizing these secrets? There is nobody chilling anything. What is being, what is, what, what the, the goals are to try to uncover terrorists. Now, I'm not, I can, I'm not denying that, that, that this doesn't have a potential effect um, on, 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 on things that we would say are perfectly lawful. But that is, the, that is always the tension. Look, read Hobbes, read Locke. That's the tension between freedom um, and, um, and, and civil liberties. You know, in, 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 an anarchic, in an anarchic society, you have perfect freedom. You're also likely to be dead. Well, I, I just want to make a comment, which, you know, in my mind, there's two kinds of surveillance programs. There are surveillance programs that are intended to deter, and there are surveillance programs that are intended to detect. So. You know, in Poland, you know, when, when the dissident would hear the clicking noise on their phone, you know, it was a warning sign to them, you know, not to talk to certain people, not to uh, undertake certain kinds of activities. And it was a deterrent. You know, they actually were afraid to, uh, to be activists or to organize. Uh, so, so that had a deterrent function. And they, there was actually a little message that would play, you know, telling people, you know, the government is listening. You know, that's not how these programs were intended to work. They were intended to detect and to collect information that could be used to uncover plots uh, and, and for investigations. But now, because, of, because we know about them, they do deter. And we do hear about people who, you know, people in this audience who, you know, you might agree with it or not, but they are being chilled. So we, we can't, you know, whether it's rational or not, whether it's intentional or not, I, do, I just don't think you can wish it away. So we should curb useful intelligence programs because some people might be chilled. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I, don't, I don't understand that argument. I don't well, find it at all forceful. Do you mean just useful, though? Because you know, I think that, that if you read the Bill of Rights, I would say the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th Amendments were written to make law enforcement's job more difficult. Not to make it easier, but to make it more Absolutely. difficult. Right. So because we, we had people, we had visionary founding fathers who were uh, at least as concerned, if not more, about a state with too much power than they were about Absolutely. a bad guy getting away. So we now have the technological capability today um, to fly drones over all of our cities with Argus cameras that actually can record every square foot uh, of that public space, uh, uh, allow someone to hit rewind. It would be very useful for cops because every, any liquor store that was robbed, you hit rewind, you see the cars that were in the parking lot and they drive away. This is a technology, by the way, that is in use in places where it should be used on the Afghan battlefield. You do want to go and see who planted that roadside bomb and where he came from. Uh, but if we deployed this in American cities, uh, the point would not be to, to chill us all, to scare us all. It would be to keep us safer from crime. But how would you feel walking down the street and holding someone's hand or kissing someone in an alley um, if you knew that in some unrelated investigation of somebody else, someone was going to hit rewind on that tape and find you and see where you were, see whose house you were sleeping in? So we make decisions as a society to not do things that would be useful for law enforcement, not do things that would be useful for intelligence agencies um, because we want to have a different kind of society, because we're worried about the chilling effect that it would have on us. Yes, the answer to that question is yes. We should not do some things because of that chilling effect. As I, as yeah. I, let me just make a comment. As yeah. I adverted earlier, these things always turn into, oh my god, 1984. You referred to drones flying over cities. You, um, you, refer, you, refer, you, know, you referred to cameras in public spaces. True, it all could be done. But that's why we live in a society in which people, through their elected representatives, say, I'm not doing this. 
Now, with respect to the Fourth Amendment specifically, in two cases, the only two cases, in which the Supreme Court has looked at issues that arguably touched on foreign intelligence, the Supremes have reserved that question. They said, we're not going to address what would be true with respect to foreign intelligence. So to say that there is a Fourth Amendment right lurking here, it may be true, it may well not be true, because there's a very big difference in terms of the security of a nation between criminals and international opportunists. The one is extraordinarily threatening, the other far less so. Let's try to close with two quick questions. We have someone here, and also I think we had a, um, someone who wanted to ask a question but maybe had difficulty standing. So can we get a question there, and then can we move the mic uh, to that questioner after, after hers? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm covering the United States as a journalist for Germany, and I think you might have heard that the whole NSA thing caused a big uh, ripple in Germany. Is there any debate in Washington about a possible backlash? Like the worst case scenario would be that um, an American friendly government like the one of Merkel would be voted out of office and other guys would be in charge who are a little bit more hostile. So is there any, is that factoring in, in, in anybody's mind at all in, in Washington? If, it's a, if there would be a backlash in Germany, well, be politically a, or socially or in, in any respect? This is an event that's happened, so it's hard. You you can't un, you can't un uh, you know undo the event the the, the event. Um, no, but is any, has anybody anticipated or giving it some thought or? I expect lots of people in Washington are giving this lots of thought. Well, I think so there's two things I would note. One is that in a recent policy speech, uh, President Obama issued a, or announced the issuing of a presidential policy directive 28, which for the first time, uh, this is you could argue this is a mild measure, but was a, a novelty, right? It imposed some of the minimization restrictions on the use and collection and dissemination of information that apply to information about Americans to foreign persons. Um, I don't think that did happen. It, yeah, it did happen. It just did. It did happen. Um, again, it's not, he's not saying you can't spy on foreigners anymore. He's just saying some of the protections that apply to Americans is saying you can't share these, this information or these people's identities unless you have a very specific foreign intelligence rationale for it. Um, used to only apply to Americans' information, now applies more globally. Uh, and certainly I think it's the case that uh, the tech industry, uh, I mean, um, I mean sort of notoriously Mark Zuckerberg sort of called up President Obama to sort of vent, um, saying, you know, you keep saying you're only targeting foreigners with these programs. Well, 75% of my customers are foreigners. This is not helpful. Um, so I think the American technology industry is interested in this in part because um, they fear very large losses of, of revenue uh, if, uh, if people don't trust the security and privacy of their, uh, their offerings. Um, I mean, there's also a huge story yesterday when the president met with Chancellor Merkel and, uh, you know, she kind of called him out. You know, he was sort of in the middle of saying, you know, that, that she's, she's kind of his bestie on the international stage, and she said, well, you know, we haven't gotten over the surveillance issue yet. And I think that uh, that's pretty potent. I mean, this is a moment where their coordination is an imperative, where they're dealing with a major international crisis uh, together. And, and she's saying, well, this is standing in the way to some degree. So I, I do think that registers. Um, it's not, you know, to the, the previous questioner, who was asking about, you know, to what degree do people uh, in the, inside the U.S. government really think about U.S. leadership and moral leadership? You know, I think kind of less than less than a lot of us would like. Uh, you know, those considerations tend to be sometimes looked at as, as a little bit soft and, and intangible. But I think, uh, you know, a moment like that uh, yesterday at that level does make a difference. If I could comment. If I could comment, there's, it is somehow immoral, immoral for the United States Intelligence Collection to understand what foreign leaders are doing and, if possible, getting them um, on, uh, recorded. We would not like to know what Mr. Putin is thinking. We wouldn't like to know years and years ago what Idi Amin was thinking. I mean, this, that's, to my mind, that, I have a hard time even understanding the coherence of the, of the argument. The intelligence agencies do things by hypothesis 
that foreign countries don't want them to do. My feeling is, hey, we succeed, good, good on us. And let's not kid ourselves that we're the only people in the world doing this. If you, you may recall, there have been articles about how NSA, among others, strongly encouraged the president to stop tweeting or whatever he was he was doing on his machinery. There are people doing this kind of thing from many governments in the world on our president. Let's try to get just a final question from the seated speaker, uh, seated questioner. Thank you. Um, I've been in dozens of meetings like this um, abroad, um, and very passionate, incredibly packed. There are fewer people here. Um, I would agree with you that this whole argument has to be placed around you as a legal question. Um, and I propose to you where, where our country is in a constitutional crisis between the First and Fourth Amendment. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit. I've been involved with index on censorship since 72 with the Soviet period. When the Soviets didn't like somebody, in fact, I dealt specifically with the campaign against psychiatric abuses, sure. they, would, um, they couldn't get their surveillance, they didn't have the web. So eventually, when they couldn't get quite enough on him, they'd say he was insane and put him in a psychiatric sure. prison. Sure. When Robert Oppenheimer, who had the most incredible security operation ever mounted on him, they didn't have enough information on him. So they needed Edward Teller to revoke his security oath. Now we've got the web. And I propose to you that you're talking within the three mile limit. That's where we have the laws. But the web is right out there in open sea. I mean, Steve Erlanger agrees with me about this. The, the lawyers of the Atomic Energy Agency who have to deal with a security. I mean, I've written on the atomic bomb project, and you can see how the security screen emerged out of the atomic. And these, these two things, the web and the atomic energy uh, security screen, have produced an ocean which, is, which has no legislation in it. So illegitimate countries can work in that area much more easily than we can. And I think we have to face the fact, and I would propose to you, and I've been proposing it across the board to people, that we have to consider the possibility that there's no such thing as a secret. Now, I've seen people risk their lives over this question, and so I've risked my life. I mean, I go in and visit Julian Assange, and I can tell you there's no secret he can't get out. We do not have secrets any longer. And I think there are questions about the security oath and how we're going to administer to that constitutionally. And when I dealt with a whistleblower in Israel who would build the atomic bomb project, uh, Ken Roth, Human Rights Watch. In Human Rights Watch, they don't deal with security oath questions. We have a problem with the security oath. It's attached to the question of what is secrets. But when I went up to, the, uh, to Chris, Chris Andrews' um, intelligence seminar behind bulletproof glass up at Corpus Christi, the spooks were saying there are no secrets anymore, and they deal with total disclosure. So, I mean, where are the secrets? And how are we going to manipulate information in the future? And how do you see the legal question being carried out constitutionally? And I guess let me sort of, I guess, add on everything. So somewhat implicit in that is we've, one of the things we've learned is that um, we do have a debate about collection within the United States within the constraints of FISA. It's clear that a lot of collection about information, both involving foreigners and involving Americans, has been uh, conducted physically outside the United States under the authority of Executive Order 12333, um, where because it happens outside the U.S., a lot of the limits don't exist. Um, so it's just, I think in part implicit in your question is, is, do these geographical boundaries and restrictions on what kind of surveillance can occur make as much sense as they did in 1978? And I apologize if that's not part of what you were getting at. But. Well, I, I think that I'm more interested in hearing what you have to say about um, what the discussions are in the intelligence community about living in a world where technology makes secret keeping very, very difficult um, and where we will have less and less control um, uh, you know, about what shows up on the front pages. Hey, life's rough, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I understand it's getting harder to, to, um, to keep secrets. Had um, uh, Mr. Snowden um, been forced to copy Xerox, the documents he released, uh, he and whatever other hundreds and thousands of people would still be copying. You know, when you can when you can send it electronically, it changes the ball game. I think there are ways of addressing that. I'm not going to bother with it here. Um, I I for, I understand this notion that we're all one world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, the fact is, geographic ba boundaries do matter. The Constitution of the United States does not apply uh, to 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 foreigners, more or less. There are plenty of exceptions. Um, in terms of our, you know, do oaths mean anything? Mine did. Mine does. You know, I, I, I promise, you know, I promise that I wasn't going to release classified information. Now, does that make me 
A uh, dinosaur? Yeah, probably. And on, on that note, I'm, I'm glad. Last word should be dinosaur. A final roar from the mighty dinosaur. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Be seeing you.